My name is Stephen Cave. I'm the executive director of the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence based at the University of Cambridge. Thank you very much for choosing our panel. We are here to talk about two topics that are absolutely central to the debate about digital ethics, fairness and transparency. But these are, of course, also two topics that are extremely contested. They're very hard to pin down. It's not only difficult to define fairness and transparency, but all of the different definitions that have been offered are incompatible with each other. I'm sure you all know that thinking about fairness of process, for example, in a level playing field, is often contradictory to thinking about fairness of outcome and making sure everyone gets the same prizes. And also, we'll be, we have to face difficult decisions when we take these concepts seriously, difficult trade-offs. Think about transparency. We all know it's important. But do we really think that a hospital should say no to a machine learning-driven diagnostic system that they know will save lives just because it's not transparent? So we know fairness and transparency are absolutely crucial principles in implementing digital ethics. But at the same time, they're extremely difficult to implement. But we are very lucky in having a panel today of people who have been already in the last years trying to implement these principles and thinking very hard about how to do that um, the best way. We have with us Carly Kine, director of Ada Lovelace Institute. We have Luke Woolen, head of partnerships at MeVitae. We have Lee Glazier, head of service integration at R2 Data Labs, which is part of Rolls-Royce. We have Chris Todd, chief superintendent of West Midlands Police. And we have Orlando Mercado, chief data scientist at Aviva. And the way we're going to do things today, we've only got an hour. Carly is going to give a provocation. And then our other panelists are going to spend a few minutes saying who they are and how their organizations are trying to implement these principles in practice. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Um, I know there's been a bit of trouble with the Wi-Fi, ironically. And uh, so Slido may or may not be working. If you'd like to use Slido to pose your questions, then do. And hopefully, I will be able to see them on this iPad in front of me. Um, but if all else fails, then we will revert to old-fashioned putting up hands. But first of all, um, please join me in welcoming Carly Kind. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I hope that um, uh, our friends at Tech UK don't regret uh, giving me the title of provo provocateur, because I will try to be as provocative as possible. And I have only one point to make, which is that our current understanding of fairness is really insufficient. And in fact, the concept of fairness as we understand it in this debate around digital ethics currently is far too impoverished to actually give us a way forward through the uh, social challenges that we face in the context of new technologies. And I think recognising that, and, and Stephen actually kind of set this up, I think, quite well, we need to start from a point which recognises that the cu current state of technological development, and in particular our current focus on deep learning, is in itself informed by certain values which promote uh, some understandings of the world and demote other understandings. So uh, the focus on, and this, I, I take this from a really interesting recent, recent paper uh, called Value-Laden Disciplinary Shifts in Machine Learning, in which the authors talk about how the focus on deep learning is a value-laden choice, which promotes the concentration of power and demotes uh, individual privacy. And starting from a point which recognises that there are value judgments in how technolo technology development is proceeding is really important. And then building on that, there are value judgments in how we critique and evaluate that technology. And uh, currently, in particular in the machine learning field, there is a real focus on this notion of technical fairness, accountability and transparency, FAT, um, as a way of solving ethical problems that I, I would argue is really um, far too uh, narrow and shallow to really help us um, move forward in this conversation about ethics. 
Um, and so we, in the technical sense, we look at um, technical solutions to technical problems. That's the way the problem is set up, I, I would say. Um, and so fairness means accuracy in this debate and it, and it means equal treatment. But as uh, Stephen quite rightly highlighted, equal treatment is not the same as equal outcomes or beneficial outcomes. And I think we're, we're really, we're, at the moment we're in a stage where we're construing fairness far too narrowly to be of actual benefit to us. Um, I think a focus on bias and discrimination will only get us so far. And um, facial recognition is the um, exemplar in this respect. Uh, we know that much of facial recognition technology simply isn't that good. It doesn't um, perform as well on women and people of minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, so a conversation about fairness, accountability and transparency in that context about remedying bias and discrimination will lead us to a point where facial recognition technology works very well on everyone. But that doesn't resolve many of the ethical issues with it. Um, uh, not least the normalization of surveillance, the persistent tracking um, and um, attendant concerns. Um, so it's important that we address these more narrow constructions of fairness, but we actually need to move beyond them quite quickly. And those, the, the questions that, that lie beyond that technical construction of fairness are much more difficult to resolve. And they're, they're, they may be socio-technical solutions, but there may be legal solutions, economic solutions, political solutions to those problems. Um, so do we need to start thinking about fairness as economic justice, fairness as mercy and discretion in a system? Is it fair that a system applied in the criminal justice um, context um, doesn't uh, have the malleability to, be, um, to take into account mercy and discretion? Is fairness about the equity, the, about equitable distribution of benefits from new technologies? Fairness that is about redress, not just accountability. Um, and fairness uh, about um, public interest superseding corporate interest. I want to give two examples of recent um, uh, applications of automated decision making that highlight the kind of impoverished notion of fairness that we currently focus on. And these are some that have gained some public attention. So the first is a, um, a system that was implemented in Michigan from 2011 um, which was designed to achieve or to further an austerity agenda um, by the governor of Michigan um, in which the, in the uh, Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency they adopted an automated uh, or an algorithmic decision making system for detecting fraud in benefit claimants. So it's called the Michigan Integrated Data Automated System or MIDAS and it was designed to detect benefits fraud and it was designed by, by external corporate vendors. The system after being implemented, wrongly identified 40,000 Michigan residents of being suspected of benefits fraud. So there is clearly an accuracy question um, that um, in a more narrow construction of fairness we would first encounter. Um, so it wasn't fair to use a system that plainly didn't work and it wasn't fair that those people were um, falsely identified as being suspected of fraud. Um, but if we move beyond that initial question, there are a range of other fairness concerns that come up in this context. We don't know to what extent the system uh, identified people falsely on discriminatory bases. It's, it's so far un uh, obscured from, from public scrutiny. So it is not fair um, that we can't scrutinize that system. Moreover, the existence of the system was not made public by the state. It was only once law firms started receiving multiple complaints um, that law firms put together the fact that there must be an automated system behind this process. So that, in, that too is not fair, that there was no transparency around this process. Uh, there was a class action brought against the state of Michigan in 2015. It hasn't been resolved yet, and the state continues to use the system, despite 40,000 people being subjected to unfair um, complaints. Um, there were 400 employees of the state who were made redundant when this system was put in place. Um, so they replaced the entire fraud detection team with an algorithmic system. So there's questions there around the fairness um, in terms of labor market and in, and in terms of the future of work and how people, uh, um, how people construct dignity and purpose in their lives. 
Thousands of people filed for bankruptcy as a result of their inability to pay the fines that they were falsely um, uh, allocated by the state. Um, and since a bankruptcy remains on their credit report for seven or more years and is very difficult to roll back, uh, the, the, there are kind of intended consequences to these false uh, allocations being made. So people's ability to apply for credit much further down the line is also impaired. Uh, people pleaded guilty to uh, fraudulent activity that they didn't commit because they either assumed that the system must be right or they wanted to um, resolve the issue as quickly as possible. And as a result, many of those people, um, because fraud convictions are designated as crimes of moral turpitude, those people can't apply to be in positions of trust such as teachers or financial advisors going forward. Um, the state took more than $100 million from residents um, fraudulently. It's only paid back $16 million to date, again, over an eight-year period. Um, and as a result, people in the state were discouraged from applying for benefits because they were concerned that they too would be subject to inaccurate uh, complaints. And that is a much broader societal problem um, and I would argue a question of social justice and fairness um, and um, not to mentioning the good function of a society that we really need to think through. So I think there are kind of layers and layers of fairness that surround uh, this system and systems like it, and we really need a much richer understanding of fairness in order to be able to grapple with it. Um, I'll quickly give one second example that highlights the diff different types of fairnesses, and that is the, um, the, the proliferation throughout the UK and in other countries of um, facial recognition-enabled billboards which, uh, which detect and analyse shoppers who are passing by them and then deliver advertising accordingly. And uh, these uh, billboards uh, claim to be able to identify with rel relative accuracy age, gender, uh, but also mood, um, so happiness, sadness, and then deliver advertising accordingly. And these are billboards that are currently being um, put in place in, in British shopping centres. Um, Putting aside the fact that many of these technologies are likely to be inaccurate, and in particular, the question I think there's a big question mark around emotion recognition and how technically um, uh, rigorous and, and accurate it is. And putting aside the questions of bias and discrimination, which, as I've just said, I think are, are, are too narrow in, in our thinking. Um, but there are a range of other fairness issues here as well. So has there been public consultation about putting these technologies at the heart of our social infrastructure. Um, our research at the Ada Lovelace Institute shows that people want the right to be able to opt out or consent to facial recognition technology. And in the context of this type of tech being used in shopping centres, they're simply not given that choice. Is it fair that we roll out technologies like facial recognition with an air of inevitability, which deprives individuals of any agency to contest them? <laughs> It's very hard to say that you're against something that you have the perception that's happening anyway. And we really are struggling to understand how the public feels about technologies in the context in which they don't feel that they have any agency to change things. And is it fair that companies can harvest data passively given out by the public, i.e. our faces, and profit from them without sharing the financial benefits from that? And these connect to much broader questions of data governance and the data-driven economy and how we think about the value that our data creates and how we benefit from that value. So I'll leave the panelists with these thoughts and make just one final argument that I think we need to move beyond conversations about bias and discrimination, although they are incredibly important, um, to further enrich in our notion of fairness. Um, there may be technical solutions to technical problems and we should face those, but we also need to acknowledge that the problems we face are much broader than technical problems and require much more expansive notions of fairness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. I think it's really valuable to zoom out like that. When we really zoom out, then we see actually some of the great political debates of our time are really about or driven by different conceptions of fairness. You know, is it, is it fair for everyone to uh, pursue wealth according to their own lights, or is it fair rather to ensure more equality of outcome, and so on? So these are very big debates, and you yourself listed some uh, different and important ideas of fairness. 
what would you say to someone representing um, a company here today, large or small, or some other group who wants to implement this technology, about how to manage all these different ideas of, of fairness in implementing their technology? I think it's a good question because um, on the one hand, I don't want to deprive the tech industry from any responsibility and and any agency in changing things as well. Um, and the risk of zooming out is that you zoom out too far and everything is uh, everything becomes um, structural uh, inequality and structural unfairness that we can't as individuals have any agency in, in solving. Um, I would say a number of things, but I think to choose one, it would be um, that the context in which technology is uh, embedded um, is incredibly important. And um, while I don't want to go down about a debate about the neutrality of technology, I think that it is really important to think about how technology is used and to own that as tech, as the tech industry and te as tech developers, to own the context in which your technology may be used and to think about that uh, throughout the development pipeline and in uh, sales and in you know responding to procurement, etc. Um, and to not, um, I suppose, wash your hands of that context question, which is really about where your technology goes after it leaves your hands. I, I would make a call to say that that is also your responsibility. And so, whereas um, in development uh, and in isolation, a technology may be completely fair, may overcome bias and discrimination um, concerns, that doesn't alleviate your responsibility, I suppose, to, um, to, to ensure that it's implemented in the right context. Great. Thank you very much. And I think that's the perfect challenge to, with which to move to our other panelists. Uh, first, Luke, uh, we hear a lot about the use of machine learning in recruitment. And at the same time, of course, recruitment historically has been an area in which bias has had a huge impact on people's lives. Um, what are you doing at MeVTI? Yeah, so, so our focus at MeVitae is helping organizations to remove unconscious bias from the hiring process. And really just to set the scene around this, because um, I think it's really important that we understand a few things. Um, so, so firstly, um, work is an incredibly dominant part of our lives. It gives us such a sense of, of belonging and purpose. It gives us a community to which we can contribute. Um, it can also give us um, uh, relationships or friendships for life as well. And so we, we cannot do, we cannot not underscore the importance of recruitment and also of its uh, relationship to, to work itself, of course. Um, so, so when you think about, say, someone who is thinking about a role change or moving into a different career, um, we have to also realize that that individual is managing, is, is uh, um, sorry, imagining um, a number of potential future realities. You know, they're thinking about whether a role could give them better pay, better opportunities, it, whether that um, role could give them uh, potentially access to, to new avenues of knowledge. Um, and so what that means is that a job application itself can be an incredibly critical point in an individual's life. And it's one that we have to take very, very seriously, especially when um, different individuals that have different heritable traits um, that might have uh, be from different socioeconomic circumstances, or perhaps um, you know, have a different mindset altogether, can react very, very differently to acceptance or rejection. So within the context of the, this discussion today, <clears throat> it's worth for us to think about you know, if a recruiter were to reject a candidate in a shortlisting process because they didn't have a, a team sport on their CV or their application, which I've seen on a number of occasions, or if perhaps, um, an algorithm that was trained with gendered data rejected that candidate. That has serious implications, both of those scenarios, one which is a human process and one which is a machine-led process um, for us and for that organization. So really, it's with its utmost importance that you know, we think hard about this and think hard about how organizations can hire not just smarter and faster, but also fairer as well. And I, I, take, the, I take Carly's points around we need to have a broader definition of fairness. But I think if we can do this, then you know, we're in a much better position um, to help ensure that the candidate experience is one which is positive and empowering rather than dehumanizing and that technology can help us live out our, our best or our, our higher values. So, so that's really our focus. And at, at MeVitae, it's around how can we reduce unconscious bias from those hiring processes. Thinking around the shortlisting process in particular 
where we see that there's a where where we see that aoristics or the dis, um, uh, shortcuts, as it were, mental shortcuts can have a damning effect on who to put through to a telephone interview, for example, or, or who to put through to a panel discussion, or whatever it might be. And um, so that's that's really our focus at Mu Yeah. Thank you. And it seems to be an interesting case where fairness and transparency are at odds. At least, I mean, often when we're talking about transparency in this debate, we talk about it as if it's an unqualified good. But actually, what you're doing is hiding certain information in order to increase fairness. Is that is that is that true? Yeah. So, so there are some. There, there's one application in particular where we automatically removing information from an application so that so that it's not exposed to a recruiter. So that means it's a blind recruiting practice, um, but we automate the entire process. So in some sense, yes, you know, we do do that. Um, but we recognize and accept the point that we need to have visibility of that information to understand if, we are act if it's actually leading to a fairer outcome um, for that candidate or for the organization as a whole. So that's something that we are acutely aware of. Yeah. Thank you very much, Luke. And Lee, R2 Data Labs, where I, I I know that you're looking at, um, you're working with a wide range of partners on various kind of data solutions. How are you trying to bake in fairness and transparency from the start? Okay. Um, so if, if we look at just the engines at this moment, there are 3,000 Rolls-Royce engines in the sky on average, and we're taking data off those engines in real time, down to ground, advanced analytics, AI, machine learning, bringing on that, that data to provide us with predictive maintenance insights. If we don't get that right, because bias has crept in or the AI has mutated, then we'll be doing maintenance too early, and that's not good for business. Um, those same principles that we use to ensure that bias or AI mutations have not crept in or we can detect they have crept in, we're moving across into our manufacturing organization. So we're looking at robots using AI-based image recognition, inspecting components. If we get the bias wrong on those, then we'll be scrapping good components, some of which are extremely expensive. Uh, so around all of that, we have a data ethics framework to ensure that we're using the data ethically. We have personal data. We can get that. That can be pilot's data. We have commercial data. We have customer's data. And all of that needs to be controlled ethically. And then as we move in these systems into manufacturing, where obviously it can have an impact on the workforce, we have an AI ethics framework, which takes the principles from GERD, EU, the Azilimar principles, and puts them into a framework where it becomes pretty much a checklist, and manufacturing engineers love a tick box exercise. Um, but it ensures that the evidence is there to show that we are being ethical as we deploy AI into our factories. Um, and I, I've gone through this with the unions who validated those um, checkboxes that we're doing to ensure that we're ethical in the deployment of AI. Again, ensuring that those bias and AI mutations are detectable. And we're moving that now across into HR and other areas within the organization using exactly the same philosophy for detecting bias and AI mutations. Thank you, and it's very interesting to hear about your AI ethics framework. Um, so who is it who has to tick the boxes? Who checks that they've been ticked right? Are they, are they audited in some way or, or reviewed? What, what kind of processes have you got behind that? Okay, I'm, I'm the sign-off. So I will approve or otherwise the evidence that is presented by the leader of the project before it goes live into the factory. Thank you. I'm sure the audience will have lots of questions about, about how that works. But first, uh, Chris. So um, the use of algorithms in policing gets a, a, a bad press sometimes, and I'm sure you feel under a good deal of scrutiny. Please tell us what you might be doing with digital technologies and how you're doing that in a way that's fair and transparent. Um, yes, good morning. Thank you. So as well as my day job in West Midlands Police, I have a national role in this area around data analytics. So I... I led on a project in West Midlands Police, Data Driven Insights, which uh, did three things. It, it, it looked at our own data, using that more effectively. It helped us visualize that in a more intuitive way. Um, and the third bit is that we built our own data science lab. So we've recruited data scientists and engineers into policing for the first time into mainstream policing. Um, and that data science lab really gets into the areas of um, things such as predictive policing, um, which is the, one of the areas which does draw that media attention. Um, 
fundamentally it looks at the wicked problems in policing um, and tries to identify ways of approaching those solutions uh, potentially. Um, and we, we felt that if we're looking at those wicked problems in West Midlands Police, then other police forces are, are probably looking at the same issues. So we should be trying to do this on a national scale and not just uh, a local scale. So that was the catalyst for a national data analytics solution, which is, which is a work in progress at the moment. Um, and the, the, there are lots of different applications of uh, data analytics, um, some of which are, are more contentious than others, but it is the predictive work that does draw that, that attention. The way in which, uh, firstly, why I think it's important is to think that we, we, we tend to, um, the, the criticism often comes from reflections on privacy rights, rights to assembly, freedom of speech, etc. Um, but there are two article rights that, that I think are sometimes um, less referenced in, 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 in this narrative, and those are the right to life and the, the, the Article 3 right prevention from uh, torture and inhumane treatment. And these are things that we face every day in decision-making in policing. It's, it's not a clean business policing. We, we see the worst of humanity as well as the best of humanity. And we have to make difficult decisions. And, and we have an obligation to protect people from harm. Um, and I'm convinced that within our data sets, there is more that we could be doing to protect people from harm. So, for example, one of the use cases that we see um, in the, the, the National Data Analytics Solution team are, are working on at the moment is around modern slavery. Um, and just applying uh, natural language processing to our intelligence logs, so these would be intelligence logs about um, drug trafficking, firearms, um, antisocial behaviour, uh, anything other than modern slavery. Um, in, in data from West Midlands Police alone, we identified, uh, I think it was uh, 15,000 intelligence logs which actually had a reference to modern slavery which we'd missed. Um, and uh, I think actually 17,000, 15,000 nominals within those. And on average, each individual that was linked to modern slavery could be grouped together with 54 other people. So those are whole networks of individuals involved in modern slavery which sit within our intelligence systems which we haven't picked up on previously until we, d we deployed NLP against the, the, the data that already sits in our systems. So that's why I think it's really important that we, that, we, that we do this, that we move with the technology, but we help develop it for public good so that we can better protect people from harm. Um, and two things really that we need to build into those processes, and they're well developed within, within West Midlands Police, and I'm trying to replicate this on a national scale, is the introduction of independent data ethics committees to give us some scrutiny from people who bring specialist knowledge to the table. Um, but that in itself is not enough because those people will be naturally selected because of the, the, the specialisms that they bring. Uh, and hopefully we can draw from people that also represent communities. But the, but the people within the specific areas of our communities where this, um, the operational activity is going to be delivered need to have a voice as well. Um, and I think we need to combine that. So the data scientists might say, if, you know, if you want to achieve this objective, this is the best way of doing it. The data uh, committee, ethics committee, might say, well, we need to put some process around that to ensure we're doing the right thing. But fundamentally, we need to understand that the public that we're delivering this service to and on behalf of think it's the right thing to do. Thank you, Chris. And it, so when you started talking and described some of the trade-offs, the difficult trade-offs that, that you face, I wanted to ask you how you make them. Um, it's clear that data can be used in a way that helps preserve fundamental rights like life and liberty. But at the same time, there are trade-offs to make with things like privacy. Uh, towards the end, when you were talking about, digital, um, about ethics panels and consultation, I was wondering, is that the process by which you resolve these trade-offs? Yes, absolutely. So we, we um, as I say, if I, if, I, if I look at focus on the West Midlands model, because that's, that's quite well developed, uh, we have a tasking process. We've had tasking processes in policing for a long time, so we have limited resources. We have to deploy against the, the priorities at any, any moment in time with the resources available to us and use those to best effect. Um, we've built the, the uh, inclusion of the data ethics committee into our tasking processes. Um, so we will, we will take a proposal to the committee, uh, we will run that through the committee uh, in an iterative way, um, and that is a very public process. So it's uh, the minutes from those meetings, the decisions that are made in those meetings, the advice that is given by the committee, they all become public documents and they're all published on our website so that um, people outside of that committee can read them, scrutinise them and reflect on them and feedback on them if necessary. 
Um, and, and, and that is an iterative process. Um, that in itself has, has drawn some attention from the media. So the first time we did this, we put a model through that. Um, and we did draw some criticism. And people, I think, unfairly suggested that we got it wrong when we put our first proposal through to the committee. But it is an iterative process purposely. It is about learning and, and continual improvement. Um, and we're just doing our learning in public for the sake of transparency um, so that we can be challenged and we can learn from that. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, and I'm sure the audience will have many questions about that, and I'm happy to say it does look like Slido is working. So please do use it to pose your questions, or uh, you can, can you vote up and down? Is that how it works? Yes, yes, yes. So you can vote for questions that you would particularly like me to then pose um, to the panelists. Um, but before we do so, or Orlando, uh, Aviva, um, as I'm sure everyone here knows, a truly enormous insurance organisation. Many people's futures and fortunes are in your hands. How are you ensuring fairness and transparency? Um, thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. So, uh, as you say, Aviva is a very, very big company. It's also a very old company. We were founded in 1696, so before the first industrial revolution. So, um, one of the, the reasons that's interesting is that it's meant that we've had to evolve a lot over the course of history. It's also meant that uh, dealing in the world of insurance, which is intrinsically linked to uncertainty, the use of you know, what we now call machine learning algorithms is not new to us. We've been using versions of these kind of technologies for, for decades. And so we're also very, very used to dealing with some of the trade-offs that happen. And I think, you know, Stephen, you mentioned the, the different competing definitions of, of fairness. If you think specifically in the insurance context, you could think maybe everybody paying the same is fair, but then that leads to people subsidizing people that are higher risk. But you, keep, you could equally think that, that people paying in proportion to their risk is fair, and that potentially leads to uninsurable people. And that's the, the trade-off between those kind of definitions is something that we've been used to dealing with for a very long time. The, the difference now is that we're trying to deal with those kind of trade-offs through technology. What we haven't been very good at is coding you know, actually codifying the way that we deal with those trade-offs. So we're trying to get a lot better at that and at least understand exactly how we're making those trade-offs rather than default to doing things that we think are fair, but in the sense of being, you know, our ability to defend them through, through a human process. If I think about how we're doing those, it's a, it's a number of different angles that we're attacking this problem. So one of them is around conversations. So we have a, an internal data ethics forum uh, which is sponsored by our CEO and our exec team. But equally importantly, we have this conversation with our regulators, we have it with other parties, third parties. Uh, I sit on the Digital Ethics uh, Forum for the Chartered Insurance Institute. Uh, and We've published a, a Digital Ethics Code of Conduct. Uh, and then increasingly, we're talking to other partners. So we are partnering with Cambridge University. We're part of the Cambridge Centre for Data-Driven Discovery. And we're funding PhDs into the evolution of fairness and the evolution of explainability of algorithms because it's a very, very hot topic in academia as well as in industry. So, so one, one angle is keeping conversations going. One of them is around uh, ways of working. So we've always been very good at having very auditable ways of working to ensure fairness. And that comes from making sure that we have uh, data that's representative of the outcomes that we're looking for, all the way through to limiting the scope of the decisions that, the, that our algorithms can make. And then the third part of it is changing the way that we interact directly with consumers. So we have published recently a customer data charter, and it's our first step at trying to simplify um, our explanation of what we do with customers' data. Because in the past, I think we, like other companies, have defaulted to very, very long privacy policies that people don't typically read very much. We want to make some very clear promises about what we're doing with customers' data and how we're using that directly to improve products and services. And we found that being really open about that has, has, has been uh, very well received by our customers. But it's not just about uh, publishing data charters. It's also about transforming our products. So um, we picked an issue that we thought customers felt was unfair, which was around the fact that people who are loyal to an insurance company typically end up paying more for, for a policy than people who are new customers. And so we designed a product that eliminated that differential. It's called Aviva Plus. We launched it earlier this year. Um, but the point is that it's not, as far as we're concerned, it's not enough to just have a robust dialogue. We also need to change the way our business works 
to make sure that we're delivering directly cons to consumers in a way that, that they feel is fairer. So those are the three parts of it, that we've got the dialogue um, internally and with partners. We have our ways of working, but also, I think importantly, our business model and the way that we interact with customers. Thank you very much, Orlando. It sounds like your thinking is very advanced. Do you feel you've been left to your own devices to work this out for yourselves? Um, would you like the, to have been more guidance from regulators? <laughs> um, I think we're, we're a very highly regulated industry, and we're very used to having a very open dialogue with regulators, and I think we'd like to see more of it. And I think the encouraging thing from our perspective is that regulators increasingly are investing in technical skills so that we can have a discussion that's not just at a very, very high level, but increasingly going down to some of the, the detailed questions that actually make a really big difference. Because everybody can agree that you need to be fair or you need to be transparent, but when you try to define those things, that's, where you, that's the crunch. And I think, um, especially when it comes to explainability of algorithms, a key point is what level of explanation and to which audience. And I think regulators find it hard to have that discussion in the detail without some of the technical skills that I think that they're, they're now investing in. And I think that's a, a welcome move. Thank you very much. So here we are at Tech UK. I've just realized that I have to press an accept button before questions appear for your assessment. Um, so there we go. I've now accepted all of these questions so that you all can now uh, vote them up or add new ones. And, and I will ask the very first one to get a vote, which is, Examples so far concern supervised algorithms. Oh, it's, oh, hang on, it's moving about. How will these principles work with unsupervised algorithms in combination uh, so transparency is unrealistic? That is where, okay, so where transparency is unrealistic because of the nature of the algorithm. Has anybody had any experience of that that they would like to comment on? Okay. When, when we're looking at um, ensuring that uh, we can detect um, bias or mutations within the AI. We actually stay outside the black box. So we're looking at using independent processes, continuous processes, um, sanity checks. Those are the things that we do. So it, it actually is irrelevant whether it's supervised or unsupervised. It's actually irrelevant even if it's an Excel spreadsheet, to be honest. Because um, you can be equally unethical with an Excel spreadsheet as you can with deep learning algorithms. So we stay outside the black box quite simply and wrap our processes around it. We do ensure through quality assurance that inside the black box is good, um, especially from day one. But if you do a check on day one and half an hour later your algorithm has taught itself something different, you've got to start again. So we effectively run an MOT on the system every 15 minutes, but we do it from outside the black box. Thank you very much. Now, an interesting question is rising to the top uh, from uh, Pete, and it is how do we handle situations where AI reflects an existing structural and societal imbalance, such as uh, gender um, and career or ethnicity and crime? Do we mirror it or do we fix it? And I think that's a, a very interesting question and, and, a, and a big dilemma for those working in the industry. I mean, if a particular neighborhood uh, with a particular community in it um, has a track record of higher crime rate for whatever reason, and it might be because it's been more heavily policed, I mean, who knows, um, then of course a predictive algorithm is going to, might well suggest that's when police should give more of their attention, and, and so a certain cycle is perpetuated. At what point do we step back and say, well, I know this is the track record, I know this is what history has shown us, but we need to, but we need to actually intervene normatively and, and stop this cycle. Um, Chris. Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question and, and quite a challenging one in itself. So a um, number of aspects to this really. Um, firstly, around bias in, in, in data sets, generally in policing, which is often a criticism, um, sometimes well-founded, but sometimes there is just bias in data and uh, it, it's important to recognize that. So, so it's not necessarily a problem, it's just something that exists. An example of that would be, for example, uh, domestic homicides. So when we talk about domestic abuse in the wider sense, um, we can have debates about whether that's a gender-based um, crime or, or not. 
um, and there are people who have views on that, but they won't all be the same. Um, but when we look at domestic homicide, um, and, and the reason why, sorry, domestic abuse is often debated is because a lot of it is hidden, and we know that a lot of it is hidden, so do we see more reported of one type than another? But when we move that on to domestic homicide, um, we, it's not hidden, it's no longer hidden. Um, and we can say that 85 to 89% of domestic homicides in the UK are perpetrated by men against women, so it's absolutely gender biased. Um, so we just have to accept that in that case, the, the, the bias exists in the data and we, we need to work with that. But there are other areas where it's, where it's less clear and more contentious. Um, and two areas in particular, uh, stop and search data. Um, I think we, we generally widely accepted across um, policing and public that stop and search data demonstrates levels of disproportionality around ethnicity. So you're more likely to be subject to a stop and search uh, if you're a young black male than if you're a young white male in most communities. I think that that, that is just a fact and it's something that policing has to, has to work on to, to, uh, to understand and try and overcome. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that we've been, we've been looking at for a while and we continue to look at. So that data um, around stop and search does include bias, un undoubtedly, um, in certain respects. Now, um, we have an example that we've looked at in Westminster Police where one of our models uh, included stop and search data initially. Um, and that was because, regardless of the potential bias um, around who is subject to a stop and search. If somebody has been stop and searched and they're in company with somebody else, the fact remains that there's a relationship between those two people. So initially that was brought into the, the considerations. Through the process I described um, previously, we, we, we soon took that out because um, that there, is, there are other types of bias within that data set um, and it is just intuitively feels uh, wrong to include that in any model that policing should, uh, should, apply, should deploy against. Um, so that's the benefit of having those discussions, um, starting with the data scientists, looking at the raw data, moving that through the tasking process, bringing in the data ethics committees, the independent overview, and the public voice through our scrutiny panels and engagement, etc., which helps us uh, eliminate those, those types of, of biases from our data. One of the other areas where, where we, we draw a lot of criticism in policing is around a concept which is referred to commonly as over-policing of certain communities. Um, that in itself, I think, is worthy of a debate because um, what some people would say is over-policing, other people would say is, is, is necessary and proportionate and, and um, welcome policing. So we look at areas of high deprivation, for example, um, correlation between high, areas of high deprivation and areas of high levels of reported crime. Now, where police are being proactive in those areas and generating engagements in data, then clearly there's, there's, there's a debate to be had there about the relevance of the data that comes from that, such as stop and search. But where members of the public are reporting crime themselves, then that's, that's not generated by the police presence there. So, so it's complex in itself, and it's something that we need to understand more and we need to work through, um, and that's a separate piece of work which is ongoing to understand whether that in itself generates um, bias within our data sets. So as long as we're alive to these, that's a good place to start, and I think we are, and by ensuring that we engage with the public, we engage with independent panels, and we have these healthy debates in public, then all of these issues can be surfaced and they can be approached. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, Luke, uh, Luke, if I can ask you to comment on this, because of course it's a big issue also for um, uh, gender and careers, as mentioned by the questioner. Here we are with many representatives of the tech industry. Women are historically, un well, in recent decades, underrepresented in that industry. And we saw from the notorious Google memo a couple of years ago that there are perceptions um, that are gender-based about ability to function in this industry. And so if people aren't um, uh, employing women, women cannot prove themselves themselves, the fact that there aren't enough women in the industry is then taken as evidence of their ability and so on. So we have a perpetuated vicious circle of bias. How is what you're doing going to solve that problem? Yeah, you certainly make a good point. I think uh, fundamentally I feel that until we address some of the structural inequalities that exist in our society, um, our tools can only do so much. They can help to correct, they can help to address. But for as long as, for example, mothers expect their daughters to be beautiful or their sons to be, um, sons to be intelligent, which is a bias that uh, Google uncovered, um, then we're going, to have, we're going to have challenges with our technologies um, simply because they are naturally trained on data which exists in our population. 
Now, we can do all that we can in MeVitae to ensure that when we are training our tools and part of our training, we don't, we don't necessarily, we don't really use black box and technology. We use a lot of statistical methods because we're very, very careful to understand how our algorithms are learning, what parameters are they developing, and what's the relevance of those parameters for, for example, shortlisting a candidate or deciding that one person is better than another person for a particular opportunity. Um, when it comes to the tech industry as well, um, there, are, there are challenges there, not least because um, there has been historic bias towards men in technology. Um, contrary to popular belief, though, it's not always been this way. If we go back to the 1930s, um, there was a role called, uh, you could be a computer. And a computer was actually a person that sat down at a desk and did calculations, mathematical calculations. And the majority of those people happened to be women. Um, but over a period of 30, 40, 50 years, um, emerging from the 70s really, men have started to dominate that field and it's become associated with men. Um, so with regards to careers, I think it's really critical um, that we make sure that there are positive uh, role models for women um, with regards to technology and STEM disciplines. And also that in the algorithms that we do use, that we make sure that we're not, we're not being as biased as far as possible. Um, we recognize they're going to be biased in the data sets, but that the people that have real skills that they can contribute to companies are able to at least get through to interview stages where they can show what they can do and show what impact they can have in an organization. Thank you, Luke. Carleen. just wanted to say that I think it is important that we don't replicate the guns don't kill people, people kill people debate in the context of automated systems. Um, Although I take the points that um, uh, tech can only kind of replicate the existing structural inequalities, there are uh, interventions we can make to ensure that they don't perpetuate those inequalities. And I think chief of the, amongst uh, which is ensuring that people are, are aware of the limitations of those systems. And I would say that um, the developers of these products are equally responsible for um, how those products are embedded in the companies that, um, that buy them and how people are trained on how to use them. We know from research that humans default to the decisions of automated systems, that they have a, a veneer of, of objectivity that is inherently trusted by humans. That's part of our, our human behavior. A computer says, no, we agree. And I think um, being explicit about the limitations of the systems and being prescriptive about how they should be embedded in the context uh, in which they're being applied is really important to, um, to, to going some way to, to getting rid of those um, discriminatory outcomes. Yes, thank you. And Carly, while you've got the mic, a, a popular question is that you correctly say that fairness is a multidimensional concept. This is what serious ethics analysis can bring, but are we involving the right kind of ethicists? Now, there aren't that many ethicists out there. If we start dividing them into kinds, then we're going to end up with a very small group to choose from. But um, I am interested to know who you think should be in the room, if we're involved in consultations, if we're auditing a system, if we're exploring the ethical consequences of it, who should be in the room? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Stephen, you'd know more about different types of ethicists than I, because I'm not an ethicist at all. I am a lawyer, um, and I work in, a, in an organization um, in the death digital ethics space, and we have staff from across economics, philosophy, um, so, socio-technical studies, uh, communications, uh, journalism, and we hope to add economists and, sorry, software engineers, of course, and, and we hope to add others. And I think having that interdisciplinary approach is, is first and foremost where we should be going with, it, with, with this ethical debate. The other thing I would say, sorry, I'm speaking too fast, getting ahead of myself. The other thing I would say is bringing the public into the conversation is really key. And um, that is both uh, to help um, guide technological design that has public legitimacy and social license. I don't think that you can achieve that unless you bring the public into that conversation. Um, and that conversation happens at a regulatory level, so bringing the public into policy conversations. But it can also happen at the tech, tech development level. And I think piloting things like public um, trials or public oversight of tech development could be a really interesting way to start to bring public expectations into the design of new technologies. And the other reason I think it's important is I think we are going through an industrial revolution of sorts. And I think we 
definitely face the risk that many people will be squeezed out at the edges, as Liz Denham said this morning, that will create multiple um, classes of people who are digitally enabled in some sense and excluded in others. And I think bringing everyone along from the conversation is really the, the primary way that we get to an ethical and socially acceptable um, techno technological revolution. Thank you. And now another popular question is on um, the GDPR elephant in the room, because of course the GDPR does have things to say about fairness and transparency. Uh, Orlando, is, it, is the GDPR something that you are wrestling with? Uh, well, I mean, of course it's something that we've invested hugely in. I, I think um, the, one of the useful things about GDPR is that it's forced us internally to have a conversation about, about the meaning of some of these terms. So if we think about the right to a... Um, an explanation from automated decision making. If you think about the way insurance works, typically we have lots of, of automated decision making. If you do an insurance quote, that'll be generated automatically. So I think internally, we, it's actually um, forced that discussion in a way that I think it w wouldn't have happened without the GDPR. So I think that's very, very useful. But I think I'd link it back to the previous point about um, what I think is not sufficient is a purely technical answer to some of these questions. I think we're not just trying to get machine learning engineers to solve questions around explainability. We're trying to make sure that these things are, are customer centric. And I think what GDPR also is, is very good at doing is pushing the customer agenda because it's all about trying to, to make sure that we're running a fair business that customers recognize as being a fair business. So I think um, we, we've, yeah, alongside the, the technical investment in, in data security and portability and some of those things, I think the more interesting part is the discussion is forced around customer centricity and how we interact with customers. Can I just jump in with an anecdote um, to illustrate the, the challenge here? I was applied for car insurance recently, not from Aviva, but um, I was on the other end of the phone and the, uh, co the call handler was saying, OK, I've put all your information in, the algorithm's thinking, the algorithm's thinking, I'm just waiting for the... And then it was kind of this bingo, okay, your premium's going up by £100 a year. And, and um, I said, why? And the person on the other end of the phone said, I, I don't know, that's what the algorithm said. And I think that that's incredibly disempowering for me as a, as a customer, but also for the person on the other end of the call. I mean, I think that there's a real question about kind of dignity and purpose of, of people in work who are, who are interfacing with algorithms. But it seems to me that the GDPR, while it has established so many important benchmarks, um, there is a long way to go in translating the right to an explanation of an automated decision which exists in law into something that people feel empowered to be able to access. And if I want to know why my premium went up, I now presumably have to go and make an application under that provision of the GDPR and enter into a lengthy process. Um, how do we make embed that at the kind of customer facing level so that I can ask that question on the phone and they can tell me directly? Thank you, Carly. My, my computer says no moment. Was a, a few years back, I had returned from abroad um, to the UK. I went to my bank I'd been with since I was 10, and they said, oh, do you want a credit card? And I said, well, okay then. So they put my details into the computer, and they said, oh, no, computer says no. And I said, why? And they said, oh, I have no idea. And then they said, but if you wait two weeks, the computer might change its mind. Um, which it did. Um, we've got a few more minutes for questions, but before, before we take a couple more questions, uh, we, Anthony mentioned that we will have a rapporteur from this session who will give feedback this afternoon, and that's John really John, could you put your hand up? There we go, John, from our centre, Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence in Cambridge. So if you have any views that you think ought to be fed back this afternoon, then please grab John in the lunch break. But we have a couple of minutes left. Um, our top question is, is there an acceptable level of unfairness to maintain individuality, function, and progress? So we are back to these difficult trade-offs. Would anybody like to comment? <laughs> Thank you, Orlando. Uh, is, is, so, is, is somebody looking for a yes or no? Yeah, I, I don't think we're in that position. I mean, I think... Um, to be honest, I think we're all fundamentally in the same situation, which is that we have to make trade-offs between different definitions of fairness. So I think we have to accept that some of these definitions will be compromised along the way. And I think the only, the best we can hope for is people actually codifying and being open about their approach to some of these definitions of fairness, and then internally and externally getting agreement that this is what, in our case, what, what customers are wanting. So I, I think I would echo Carly's point from earlier in that 
definitions of fairness are, are insufficient. We need, to, and, and in particular, algorithmic or technical definitions of fairness will always be insufficient. I think the way that we're trying to tackle these problems is essentially by saying to our customers, this is the kind of business we're running, do you want to come and interact with us? And certainly in competitive markets, we would hope that we want to set ourselves up as being a, a, a business that customers do want to interact with. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if it really answers the question, but, but from a, a policing perspective, I think you know, it, it's really important that we try to be as, as fair as, as we possibly can. Um, and when we're using um, intrusive powers, etc., cetera, um, and often the decisions that, that arrive uh, or, the inf or the insight that arrives from data analytics can, can inform that. Um, we're very conscious that um, accuracy um, is linked to fairness. Um, it, it will be very rare that we would have a tool that would be 100% accurate. So the question then is, what is the intervention that you're going to put in place if it's a predictive tool, for, for example? Or what, what, is, what is the task that, that follows on from the insight? Um, and, and really, we just need to make sure that that's positive. So, you know, if you use an example of a predictive tool and it, and it gets it right 99% of the time, you deploy it against a cohort of 100 people, that's still one person that has potentially had an intervention delivered against them which, which was unnecessary. If that is still a positive intervention, then we're getting somewhere towards being fair nevertheless. Thank you. So we, we've got one minute left, and there's an interesting question here. How do you ensure an automated or semi-automated tool um, to reduce human bias doesn't encode other biases that are harder to see? Now, I don't want to uh, pose exactly that question, but rather, if we can end on a more optimistic note, if we'd been here 10, 20 years ago, we might have been talking about how we can use algorithms to make various decision-making processes fairer. That it, because, of course, we're not starting from a baseline of total fairness or total transparency, but rather the messiness of human decision-making and, uh, and, and human decision-making systems. So are there ways in which you think we can use the kind of technologies we've been talking about to actually make decision-making fairer and more transparent than the human baseline? Well, I mean, I'll tell you the reason why I'm optimistic. I, I think, ultimately, for all the talk about black box algorithms, these still contain formulas which are way more auditable than any human decision-making process. I think humans are the ultimate black box. And I think that if we're thinking about the way that human decisions have been biased in the past, I think replacing those with some degree of, of codification, which comes from a, a machine learning or, or an algorithmic approach, I think at least gives us the opportunity to audit it. And I think the way in which we do that, I think, needs to evolve. I think the thinking around the way that we audit algorithms is still very buoyant. It's still a growth area. But it will get to a much more auditable, auditable place in terms of being able to explain what it is that we are doing. Can I just, just add 100% agree with you? I think another thing that we can do is synthesize data. So we, we create, for example, 2 million flights are synthesized and we pump those through the system. So you can do that on any sort of system where we're going to be doing it on our robotics, we're going to be doing it on our image recognition systems, we're looking at doing it on our CVs. So it's synthesized data that you can trust. It may be coming out of a laboratory, if it's for our image recognition, it's synthesized flights for our predictive maintenance. Those are the things that I think we could do and I'm also very optimistic. Good, thank you. So. A huge amount still to do, of course, a very fraught area, and yet some really interesting precedents, I think, for how to make progress in ensuring the use of this technology is fairer and transparent, and some optimistic notes at the end on how we might even become fairer and more transparent through this technology. Um, so now, I believe, is lunchtime, but before you go, please join me in thanking our panel.